Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am just um, happy to be talking to you today here on July 11th. And uh, our topic for today is fidelity. And when I was tuning in, I heard Tom talking to you and reminding you about uh, how to use the chat system. And um, so feel free to ask any questions you might have. Um, he can also open the lines up at some point if you want to ask a correct, uh, question live and direct if you're not a typer. Um, okay, so somebody in the chat bar asked the question, what is the status? Um, okay, I guess you'll figure that out with Tom. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about this matter of fidelity. Uh, our quote today from Jeanette Winterson says, when I say I will be true to you, I am drawing a quiet space beyond the reach of other desires. And that is a really incredibly um, complex statement, I think, because one of the many paradoxes of life, and Patrick Carnes talks about this too, is the paradox of fidelity to oneself and fidelity to others. And how do we maintain both of those? And I think in this quotation, she's saying, I'm true to you. I have to Rebond my other desires um, to stay true to you. But I would also argue that fidelity requires this paradox of being true to myself while I'm being true to others at the same time. And that is a tension that we have to negotiate all the time. And I think more often in this incredibly busy world that we live in than ever. So let's hold that notion um, as we move along here. So we often think about fidelity as being true to another person. And we locate that person, obviously, that commitment outside of myself. So I'm going to be faithful, let's say, relationally to you or another person. Um, I'm going to be faithful to my commitment at work so that I show up for my job on time, I end on time, um, I do my work in the way that my employer expects me to. Um, I'm faithful to my, perhaps my parents in terms of being a good daughter or a good son, and to my children, um, whether it's to be a good aunt or a mother or whatever your role is with somebody else or uncle. Um, but how do we stay in this second point, which is the true meaning of fidelity, which is the devotion to ourself. And again, I think this is complicated because so much of devotion to self has been redefined as a profound narcissism in our culture, that everything I do is about me and I have my rights to be who I want to be and I can be everything there is, and it all circles around me, me, me. And that's not what I think the true notion of fidelity is about when we talk about a devotion to ourself. Um, when I'm faithful or when you are faithful um, to yourself, then you can be faithful to other people, other commitments around you. And therein lies the paradox of being uh, faithful to myself and to other people at the same time. How do I do both of those? So consider that being faithful to a person, a cause, or a belief means a commitment to your own integrity and to your own values. Uh, so oftentimes we think, well, if I'm faithful to the other person, that's a burden to me. Um, or if I'm faithful to that thing or that cause, I can't be to another one also. So I really feel strained or I feel pulled apart so it really shouldn't be an external obligation. It should be guided by your internal sense of integrity and what's right and wrong, your internal sense of uh, what your value system is and how you put all that together. So honoring your own principles is really the only way to stay loyal to another person because when we break our vows to someone, we're really disavowing ourselves. If I have a vow of monogamy to my partner and I cheat on that person, then I'm really cheating myself ultimately. I'm the one who's going to be ground down at the end of that. And 
there's a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous about, you know, drinking your own poison to get back at someone else. And I think that comes from experiences that probably everybody had in high school or in college where, you know, somebody broke up with you and you were hurt or pained, so you went and acted out to get back at that person. So you drank too much or you had sex with somebody you didn't really like. But, you know, the point is, who are you really hurting at the end of the day? That other person may never know about your antics or if they know about them, they may perceive you as being weak or a little bit crazy or not someone who is stable and that's why they broke up with you to begin with. So you're really not doing yourself or the other person any favors or getting any message across. So <clears throat> how do you completely stay faithful to yourself in the decisions that you make. And that can be challenging because if I want to go do something and there are opposing agendas with, say, you know, a partner, a child, a parent, and that everybody's going to get what they want or need, I have to determine what's going to be in my best interest and everybody else's best interest also. So if you have, let's say, an aging parent and... um or a parent who's not feeling well and you're an adult and you have a decent relationship with them, but it's July 4th weekend and you've made all these great plans to go have a good time and <clears throat> maybe have a party a little bit and that person gets sick, what do you do? Do you stay steadfastly faithful to your plans and what's good for you? Or are you faithful to that person because they're in need? And that really depends on your sense of integrity and your value system. And in that also can be a big or thin slice, depending on who you are, of codependency. So maybe the person isn't that sick or infirmed and they really can manage with you, without you. Um, you really want to go follow through with your plans, but your codependence doesn't let you. That is not being faithful to yourself. Um, it's being faithful to the other, but not for the right reasons. Or let's say, conversely, the person in your life is very ill or very infirmed, and they really need somebody to make sure that they don't get too high of a fever or they need someone to go get them juice and soup, um, and they're seriously sick, but you selfishly really want to go to the beach that July 4th weekend, Um You've got to weigh out what's true there and what isn't. And going through with your plans anyway may be an act of self-centeredness and lack of compassion, um, and sometimes it might be a matter of codependence. But that's for you to decide based on what your values are and whether you're in your integrity or out of your integrity. So think about fidelity, again, as um, being about a devotion to your own self. I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts or questions about that at this juncture. <clears throat> All right. Well, honoring your own principles is the only way to rely and remain, rather, loyal to another person. Because when we break our vows to someone, <clears throat> as I said earlier, we're disavowing ourselves. So when you're dating somebody or if you've been in a relationship with someone and you haven't had this conversation, let's just say when you're dating somebody, you should let someone know what your principles are, what you value, what has meaning to you, and where you draw the line with certain things. And you don't necessarily have to give a speech about this. It will come up in the dating process when you have a date and then it's you, you know it's Father's Day. And it's like, oops, I made a date on Father's Day. I really want to be with my dad. I've got to tell you that I really like you a lot, but I actually love my dad more. You might not say that, but that's the message. Because this is a value that I have. This is one of my principles. This is my integrity. So these things will play out and you'll have to negotiate them along the way. And that's a part of being intimate and honest and real. You're also setting the stage for how this relationship or how you need a relationship to go down the road. If you've been in a long-term committed relationship and you haven't revisited your value system or perhaps they've changed along the way, then it's worth talking to your spouse about. Sometimes as we age and we get older, um, our value systems change. 
when we, you know, I remember many years ago when I would go into a department store um, and I would go with a girlfriend, we were always headed to the clothing department. We were always looking at clothes because it was always about, well, what are we going to wear this weekend um, or shoes or something of that nature. And I was with my closest friend once, and I think at that time we both were around 30 years old. And we went into a department store and we wanted to go to the home store. We wanted to look at sheets and towels um, and cookware. And it really struck me me that I had entered a different phase of my life, that the things that once mattered most mattered less. Nesting things were more intriguing and interesting to me. So likewise, as we age, the things that were most previously interesting, even with our partners, may change because we may become more family-centric or friend-centric, where the thing that matters the most to us is our relationship with people, not even necessarily having the adventures we once were devoted to having. So make sure you are constantly looking at what your own value system is, what has you in and out of your integrity, and then communicating that to the people around yourself. Um, Somebody writes what what the best approach in healing when you are codependency loyal to people who are narcissistic and take advantage. I think that's what is the best approach. Okay. And how do you begin being loyal to yourself? What's the first step to pushing through the childhood guilt of enmeshment? Well, I think for starters, it's really useful to read some of the premier books on codependence, uh, namely, Um, Facing Codependence um, by Pia Melody and Codependent No More by Melody Beatty. These are two classics in the field of codependence. And Melody Beatty's book, The Language of Letting Go, which is a daily book of meditations for codependence, I think is enormously helpful. Because every day there's a theme and every day there's a meditation and an encouragement to stand strong and express yourself and do what's true for you. And looking at also the cost-benefit analysis of what codependence brings you, Um, because there are definitely secondary gains from uh, making sure everybody likes you, um, being the center of attention, doing everything so you can get the validation and love you need. Um, There's also a cost to that, which is it can be enormously exhausting. Um, You become needless and wantless. Other people trample over you. So start out with making the pros and cons list of being codependent, Um, being at the beck and call of everyone, being loyal to those who harm you. What do you get out of that? Um, And then how do you become a victimizer yourself from the position of being the doormat? Now, I know these are harsh-sounding words, but we have a tendency to coddle people in our culture um, who look like the victims, who look like they're being harmed, who look like they're being used. And I know that victims will also use that position to retaliate, to get back at. So it's a very passive position and one that you want to question heartily in order to get out of it. I would also recommend that you go to some CODA meetings, uh, which is Codependence Anonymous, and that's a 12-step fellowship that's free that you can Google and find meetings in your town. My guess is they may also have meetings online, so um, I recommend that you check that out as well. Uh, it says that California and uh, tied up with marriage, rebuild my, uh, my house uh, burnt in a fire, um, torn as back in Melbourne, Australia. My parents are in their late 80s and failing. What are your thoughts? So I can't tell from what you're saying, Julie, if you're in a marriage that you don't want to be in. Um, it sounds like your house burnt down and you had to rebuild it, and you're torn about whether you should go back to Melbourne or not. Um, I don't have enough information to answer that question for you, but I do suggest that you um, seriously take a look at, again, what are the pros and cons of staying in the States? Um, Your parents are elderly. They're going to pass away. It's just a question of when. And do you have unfinished business with them? And is there a way that Um, Again, you can navigate both, and this would require a conversation with your spouse about what will it be like for you if I leave for a month and come back 
for maybe two months and then go back again. Or maybe we go together. Or maybe we design our life in a different way um, because time's running out. And, you know, this is one of the perils of globalization and a world that started really before globalization where we started migrating and moving and leaving the places that we grew up in where our friends and family were and um, sort of striking out on our own. And then we start to see, you know, the pain of the distance and also how that can erode families and um, communities over time with everybody being so transient. So I want to encourage you to have a conversation with your partner about what this means to you and how painful it is. And maybe you don't get to move back or go visit, but at least you're talking about what's true for you so you don't end up resenting yourself and your partner. Um, Dave on the phone says, the opening reminded me of Maya Angelou quote, which says, the best love is the one that makes you a better person without changing you into someone other than yourself. And I would add to that that the best love, the truest love, is a love of self. Because it's a love that cannot be taken from us. We can't, um, we're, we're not going to be abandoned by ourselves unless we do something really radical to hurt ourselves. Um, but this is a beautiful quote. The best love is the one that makes you a better person without changing you into someone other than yourself. And isn't that what we want from our partners and what we should extend to our partners all too often, people get in relationship with other people because they're looking at all the things they think they can change about them or that they will change. And that's really an act of violence. That is not an act of love or caring. It's highly manipulative. And so we want to be in relationships where we bring out the best in people and they bring out the best in us, not ones where we're trying to change each other because that's where the codependence and the resentment get you know, really, really fiery. And um, we have a comment here from Robert who says, when we integrate our values into our behavior, we demonstrate integrity, which is well said. And if we want to live in harmony, it is imperative that our actions match our word. And so being in integrity is your, your behaviors are reflective of what you say. So it's important, especially if you're in recovery from any addiction, that um, your, the people around you see what you do, not what you say. They see that you're really showing up in your integrity and that you, um, your actions match what you're saying, which is pretty much the same thing that I am saying. And James says, do you think seeking approval from others is the biggest obstacle when it comes to fidelity to self and others? And how do we approve of ourselves enough so that we don't need other people to do it for us? Well, this is another paradox because we all need validation from other people. We all want to be seen, heard, and understood. And children certainly need that probably more than anything. Um, really, really a sense that we matter, that we're appreciated, um, that people are curious about what our experiences are, how it's going for us. Um, and so I don't think that, um, that that's an obstacle. I think when we give that kind of uh, approval or validation to our partners and we get it in return, I think it actually makes it easier to be faithful to ourselves and to them because we feel loved and cared for and we want to love and care for in reverse in the same way with all of those around us. And it makes it easier then when you have a partner who really sees you. Um, if you want to go do something they don't want to do, they, they understand it because you've been honest about who you are. And how do we approve of ourselves enough so that we don't need others to do it for us? Well, I think that's a daily practice of self-love, of self-affirmation. It also has to do with engaging in behaviors and activities that make us feel solid internally, that make us feel good about ourselves, that make us feel like we're living in integrity. So you kind of know that feeling in your chest and in your heart and in your gut when you um, feel joy or lightness internally, um, then you have sort of a self-approving system. And that doesn't mean there aren't moments when we feel needy, when we feel we want someone else to tell us that we're doing a good job or that we matter 
or that um, what we're doing has some consequence in the world. So, again, that's another paradox that we have to hold is validation of the self while also requesting validation from others and knowing where the line is between using other people to prop yourself up versus not needing anybody at all because you've got it all figured out. There's a lot of gray areas in that. Um, Okay, the practice of fidelity. Constancy in a relationship requires discipline, and that means you do what you say, your actions follow your words, um, that your partner doesn't have that horrible feeling that we hear that uh, people say, well, you know, when I married this person, they became a completely different person. That's a nightmare, and nobody should have that experience, and we shouldn't perpetrate that experience on other people. You need to be congruent with who you are. That's a way of being faithful to yourself and faithful to others, and that requires a discipline. Um, if you say you're an honest person, then your actions have to reflect that, and you might have to go the distance to make that happen. Um, if you're someone who considers yourself a good citizen, that requires a lot of discipline. And I'll tell you, in the simplest ways, the one that we can all relate to is when you go to the grocery store um, and you're finished packing your car and the cart is sitting there. What do you do with it? Do you walk it back to where the carts are um, so that the carts are orderly, so there are carts for other people, so the poor person that's got to run around the lot gathering the carts doesn't have to gather one more? Um, and also so you don't leave it between cars where somebody scratches their car or bumps their bumper? Um, or do you leave it in a place that's safe enough that it's not going to roll and smash into anything or scratch anybody's car? You know, how do you make those judgments on any given day? You know, on the days when I'm in, a, in the biggest hurry, I grapple with that in that moment and saying, wow, what am I going to do here? Am I just going to jam this between two cars or am I going to walk all the way back and put it away and it's hot? And, um, and these can be internal conversations all the time. And there are lots of examples of that. So how disciplined are you in your constancy in terms of your behaviors reflecting who you think you are and who you say you are? And if there's an agreement to stay faithful from the beginning, discipline will sustain us over life's rocky crags, but only if fidelity remains our guiding principle. And so there you have it. Um, in those moments when you have to make those little decisions and even big ones, if you come back to what your agreements were, what you said you were going to do, and you stick with that, then your compass is really pointed in the right direction. And wavering from that um, will create problems for you ultimately. And we have a tendency as human beings to want to blame other people for why things don't go well. But when we really look at why things aren't going well in a relationship, it can often be because we have not been clear um, about the way things should have gone or we've not been fair or not... Um, we're not in our integrity. Think of someone who needs your help, and what gesture can you make to be faithful to that relationship today? What will it actually cost you um, to call an elderly parent, um, to go out of your way to reach out to someone, <clears throat> and what do you have to give up in order to do that? And is what you're giving up, <clears throat> excuse me, does it really matter, or is it a selfish endeavor that you really wanted to go by you know, Starbucks and get a coffee, but now you're not going to be able to go. And are you going to whine about that? Or are you going to recognize that you really don't need to spend the money and you don't need an extra jolt of caffeine? And in fact, doing this other thing is more important to you. So think about that. Um, who is one person that needs your help today? And what can you do to be faithful to that relationship? It may even be to send an email or a text something that says I'm thinking about you and that's part of the discipline of relationship and being faithful to all living beings uh, we've made commitments to sets an example for the younger people in our lives modeling what genuine fidelity looks like and that is also about discipline this is how children learn not by what we tell them to do but what they see us doing and also they then will hold that as an ethos internally 
So if you have pets and you don't tend to them, then you're not really keeping your commitment um, of fidelity to being a good pet owner. And that means making sure they have food and water before you leave, uh, making sure that they're brushed and tended to and that they get their shots and that you really are treating them um, with the dignity they deserve to be happy and to flourish and to keep you happy, because that's why we all have pets anyway, because they make us feel good. They actually change our brain waves, it turns out. So, um, And what that models to the children around you is that when we make a commitment to another living creature, we keep it. And it's not a commitment that we should take easy or lightly. Having a pet doesn't mean it's just in the house. It means you've got to work for that creature, you have to tend to that creature. Um, otherwise, you're negligent, and that can become traumatizing to everybody. So let's look at the origins of fidelity now. Um, I think we have another question here from the phone. How does someone navigate the pain and challenges after a long-term relationship dissolves late in life due to infidelity? Boy, that is such a big, big and painful question and one that is um, so difficult to answer because it's so different for everybody. Um, when we lose a partner, whether it's after five years or 15 years or 25 years, it's an incredibly painful loss because our attachment systems bind to that other person. Um, we grow all sorts of new connectors and uh, neurochemicals flood our bodies, and when we lose that person, it feels like the loss of an appendage because everybody's had a breakup at one point in their life, and it's physically painful because it's physically registering in the brain and in the body. And what it takes for us to rebuild our sense of self, our sense of security, our sense of identity independently of that person is extraordinarily difficult and requires a high level of discipline if anybody's ever had to do it before. And so this is where the requirement of getting to know the self, I think, is paramount. And that means finding out what you like, what you don't like, getting out into the world, whether it be taking classes finding a spiritual practice, engaging with other human beings, going for walks on the beach or hiking, joining clubs, um, really trying on a bunch of different things so we can start to notice what's difficult for us, what challenges us, what we do and don't like independently of that person, and we start to meet other people that make us feel good about ourselves because typically when relationships end, we're not feeling very good about ourselves anyway. And even when we know it's not good and it's over, um, we have a tendency to hold on longer than we should because we're afraid and it's painful. So I would invite you to have a lot of self-compassion to really give yourself a break, to take it slowly, and to slowly start to wade into the waters of the world. And that's not about dating either. That's about just getting to know yourself. And summer is, I think, an extraordinary time for that because the days are longer. Um, there are more opportunities to go outside and be out in the world more freely. And really take this time to explore, to see if you can reinvigorate a sense of play also for whatever that means to you. Um, and I think this answers your question. Our very self is tied to other people because from the beginning, from the time we're infants, without another person to reflect to us and to help our brain start to develop appropriately, we will, um, we will not flourish and ultimately will die. Um, there's a failure to thrive in infants. We require other human beings in order to come to fruition and in order to function. And at the same time, we're highly autonomous beings. So we can't really do without other people. It's very isolating. It's not good for the nervous system. It's not good for the immune system. And so you have to reach out and start to make other relationships when you lose one. And so even with that, um, we talk about musical recordings where fidelity is pristine when it's the replication of the original. So being true to another means upholding our original intention. 
But our ideas about fidelity may be tarnished by the role models we grew up in, um, who maybe uh, gave us a poor representation of what real fidelity meant. They may be tarnished because we've um, been cheated on and we've lost relationships, or maybe we did the cheating. So all of these things um, are ways of looking at this concept of fidelity and how we want to maintain our intention to be pristine, to be true to ourselves, and therefore true to others. But we might be battling representations um, from the past that make it more difficult for us. And because of a lack of good role models, um, all the sacrifices we make for the benefits of staying true to ourselves um, can fall short because we can't see all of the components that go into fidelity. Uh, so that's why I think it's important to really unpack um, the dynamics in your family without being on a witch hunt against your parents, but really looking at why things happened the way they did and what we learned and the challenges that those have wrought and then how those have been indelibly imprinted into our current relationships or how we treat people. And then look at what you want to do differently. How you don't need to stay in that family system anymore, um, but how you do want to uh, be different in your relationships and break old patterns. And remember again that all living relationships require fidelity, even with a plant. You know, that's not going to be reciprocal. I sort of, it is sort of passively, but, you know, if you get a plant, if you bring it home, then you must be faithful to that being. You have to water it. You have to give it sunlight. You have to make sure it's got fertilizer on occasion. Um, if you don't, it will die. So do you practice fidelity in all of your relationships? Think about all of them, your goldfish, your plant, um, the people you most love, your, your kids, your family, etc. And think about the steadfast commitment it takes just to keep a single houseplant alive. Um, as I was saying, you want to make sure that you're maintaining and sustaining it so that it blooms into its full potential. Um, getting a new pet, beginning a new acquaintance um, if you're out of a relationship, nourishing an old friendship, or committing to a love relationship all require reliable efforts to thrive and grow. Um, I think we've all had that experience where we've been on the receiving end of people who've been deeply caring, um, but then challenging ourselves how we can be more caring. Um, I think it's easy to lose sight of being caring in the simplest of ways when we're all so busy and beleaguered by the demands of the world we live in. So as I said earlier, can you send a text? Can you send somebody a photo today or a phone call if they're elderly and they don't participate in you know, the world of computers? Um, can you just reach out to an old friend and say, you know, sorry I haven't seen you in a long time, but I'm thinking about you? Because without that, the threads start to turn into shreds, and then, you know, people drift away, and before we know it, we're alone and often lonely. And have you been unfaithful to the commitments you've made? Of course, the biggest one is when we are unfaithful sexually in monogamous um, what our partners think are committed relationships. That's the most egregious breach of commitment because of the unbelievable pain it causes the person who's on the receiving end of the betrayal. Um, it reorganizes people in a way where they no, no longer trust um, love relationships. Um, they feel like the world just isn't a safe place. They feel like their reality skewed and that they can't believe anything around them any longer because what they thought was true was not true ever. And so that kind of lack of faithfulness um, is profoundly damaging to the person on the receiving end of it. And it's also damaging to the person who treats themselves that way. That requires a high level of compartmentalization um, and dissociation. So Take a look at the ways that you've been unfaithful to yourself and to others. And make a list of how you can rectify what is out of alignment with yourself 
and take action on each item one by one. So where are the ways you're not faithful? You could not be faithful to your nutrition. You could tell yourself that you're eating healthfully, but maybe you notice that you've kind of not been eating so well in the last month. And how do you rectify that? And um, if you're not eating well, maybe the people around you aren't eating well if you're the person that provides food or cooking. So take a look at all the ways that you're out of alignment. Another way might be exercise, that you uh, tell yourself that you're fit or that you're going to work out, uh, but you're not really getting it together to do that, and so you're being unfaithful to yourself. And then maybe your partner starts to put on weight and you get judgmental of that person. Meanwhile, you're not a shining example of that yourself. So you don't really get to be judgmental if you're guilty of it too. So look for places where there is hypocrisy in your life, where fidelity is concerned. So does anybody have any questions about any of that? Um Okay, so if somebody says, uh, when I was betrayed in a romantic relationship with someone who couldn't be loyal, I found it made me question my self-worth. I'm pretty sure that's the biggest lesson you come out of that. Um, why is self-worth so tied up with other people? Um, I don't know if I answered that question, um, but I think I answered the question about self-worth being tied up with other people. It's because we... Um, expect mirroring from other people, and we expect to be cared for by others when others tell us they're going to care for us. And we also attach profoundly to other people, especially when we're sexual with them. So we do, um, especially when we're cheated on, have a sense that, you know, I'm not good enough or smart enough or attractive enough or sexy enough. Like there was something inherently wrong with me as opposed to, you know what, it wasn't me. There's something wrong with that person who cheated on me. That person could have come to me and said, hey, I don't like your hair or I don't like the way you talk to my mother or I don't like the way you you know, spend your money. And if we don't work that out, I don't want to be in this relationship not um, blindsiding you and cheating on you and damaging your self-worth in that way. So here's a long um, comment from someone on the phone. Sometimes our readiness to have our difficulties removed depends on what we call them. If misnaming our defects makes them seem less defective, we may be unable to see the damage they cause. And if they seem to be causing no harm, they would even <clears throat> ask our higher power to remove them from, why would we e oh, ever ask our higher power to remove them from our lives? So I think that's true. I think we have to be very careful about um, not being honest with ourselves about what's true. That if something, if you consider something is a defect of your character and you're in a 12-step program and you're asking your higher power to remove these defects from you, which your higher power cannot do without you working on it also, otherwise it's magical thinking, um, then you don't want to minimize that you, know, you have trouble with honesty. Let's say you're someone who's not honest, that you lie. That's a very serious defect. And to act like it isn't is more lying and more denial about that. So it's incumbent upon all of us to look at what our defects are, where we're not faithful to ourselves and therefore to others, and to make those changes ourselves. Here, Robert gives an example of people-pleasing. He says, it doesn't really sound all that bad, does it? It just means we're nice to people, right? Not quite. To put it bluntly, it means we're dishonest and manipulative. We lie about our feelings, our beliefs, and our needs, trying to soothe others into compliance with our wishes. And I would say that's true. I think people-pleasing sounds lovely, like, you know, you're caretaking to other people, but really um, it can be like this question someone asked earlier about codependence. It can be highly manipulative. Um, it can be a way to passive aggressively get your needs met without ever having to be direct, without ever having to confront somebody. Um, lying about our feelings, our beliefs, and our needs, trying to soothe others into compliance with our wishes, or perhaps we think we're, quote, easygoing, but does easygoing mean we ignore our housework and confrontations and stay put in a comfortable rut? Um, of course, the answer is no. That's not really easygoing. That sounds more like um, a form of passive-aggressive laziness to me. And then a better name for it 
would be laziness or procrastination or fear. Thus, if we want to live in integrity, we need to say what we mean, mean what we say, and not say it mean. So all of that is true and useful. Um, This is about self-confrontation, getting to know ourselves, being faithful to ourselves, so we're not misrepresenting ourselves to other people and therefore can be faithful to them. So as we've been talking here, or as you're listening here to me today, you can see that fidelity is very costly. It requires a lot of work, a lot of discipline, but it's extremely valuable. Um, Virtue demands that we give up some things in order to have some things worth much more, namely integrity with ourselves and with other people. So think about all of these Um, qualities like fidelity, virtue, integrity, these are not just words. These require incredible actions, a sense of vigilance, a sense of self-confrontation on a daily basis to make sure that we are properly aligned when we make decisions, no matter what they are. So um, when you walk out the door and you shut the door before you walk out of your house, you should ask yourself, have I really tended to everything I agreed I was going to tend to today? Was I lazy because I didn't leave a window open and it's going to be really hot today and my cat's in there alone? Um, go back and open the window. Do what you need to do so that you're taking care of yourself and you're in alignment um, with the person that you want to be and that you're faithful. So any other questions before I wrap up this conversation on fidelity? Hello? Hi, Alex. Um, yes. I think, do you see the question from Terry? Um, oh, there it is below. Oh, okay, there are a lot more questions. Sorry. Okay. Um, So here's one. I have trouble understanding the balance between safety and fidelity and loyalty. When I don't feel safe, how do I negotiate disengagement from my commitment that is now making me feel unsafe? So when you don't feel safe, you're going to have to disengage from your commitment because I think that is a place where um, if you – If I commit to crossing the street um, to see you and there's a train coming and if I don't cross the street now, you're going to have to leave to get to your appointment, but I have to risk my life to cross the street, it's better for me to not risk my life by throwing myself in front of the train because what if I trip or fall? Um, And I'm going to have to deal with your disappointment that I didn't make it on time because otherwise I could possibly have killed myself. And that's kind of a silly example, but it's illustrative of what we're talking about here. Ultimately, you have to ask yourself, is it worth the relationship? Am I being in a collaboration with that other person when I compromise what my own wants and needs are? Is it for the good of the whole, in other words? Or is it going to be damaging to me? Is it going to hurt me to go do that thing, whatever it is? And if it's going to hurt me, if it's going to take me out of my integrity, then I shouldn't do it. And you should trust your gut and your heart. Trust your body. That's where the answer is for this, not the reasoning, oh, I really should, um, because that can get you into trouble and you can hurt yourself. Someone asked, how do I recommend how do you recommend I rectify with a romantic partner after I have had a one time unfaithful event? Um, is coming clean with one's partner always the best thing to do, even though it will cause him or her profound pain? Well, I think this is a um a, a situation you're gonna have to grapple with yourself. You know, can you live with looking that person in the eye, knowing that you've cheated on that person and not telling them. And what do you have to do to rectify that internally? I would imagine that would require a lot of therapy, a lot of tough conversations with yourself about whether you're going to do it again or not. Um, Because if you're going to do it again, you will ultimately get caught. And you're really playing 
uh, I'll use the word God with that person's life because that person doesn't have all the information they need to be in relationship with you. They're in relationship with you on good faith. They believe you are who you say you are. And if you're lying about this, what else might you lie about? If you tell the truth, you're in your integrity, and yes, it's going to hurt that person, and you may lose that person, but that is the consequence of your action. And you want to take serious stock about that, that we do things all the time in life, and there are actions and consequences. If you steal something from a store and you get caught and go to jail, that's the consequence of stealing. That's a choice that you make. Um, there are many, many things where there are actions and consequences. And so if you cheat on somebody and you really love them and care about them and you want them to happy, have a happy life, maybe telling them is the best thing because maybe they can forgive you, which is their choice, not yours, or maybe they decide they don't want to be with you and that's the responsibility of you and it will teach you a lesson again about doing that because the next relationship you get into hopefully you won't do that again so i suggest you think long and hard about that um, and also consider that one lie like that that's a very big lie will start to beget other ways of lying in the relationship and do you want to build a relationship on a foundation of secrets and lies um, Terry says, we are in a couple in recovery. <clears throat> My husband returned from gentle path the end of April. So this ideal uh, definition of infidelity is now different for me. These were not love relationships outside the marriage, as you know. However, we are just on the other side of the impatient and going to our CSAT therapist and working really hard. Uh, there are times when I just have such a hard time with all of this. It's overwhelming. On the one hand, I'm so upset from my husband's childhood abuse, and that freaks me out. Yet the acting out went on for years, even before me. Now I struggle with trust, and it's the one thing he needs uh, to feel close to me and repair, but trust has to be earned, so I'm not ready. Can you comment on all of that, please? I have a daily struggle wanting so much to be intimate and loving, yet it is such a trigger. Well, this is such an unbelievably difficult point to negotiate, Terry, because I really believe that the partners of sex addicts are the ones who are betting the farm, because there's no guarantee that it won't happen again. Um, Oftentimes, and I'm just going to say this in kind of a gender stereotypical way, but you know, women have a tendency to have a lot of empathy and compassion for those around us that we love who were injured or harmed. Um, and so we start to see that this person's not a bad person. Bad things were done to them, so they became distorted and um, traumatized, and they were just acting out in these very bad ways. But how do you start to trust this process? And the answer really is just time. You know, there's an adage of no major changes for a year, and so people are encouraged to really focus on what they want. I would encourage you to think about what kind of life you want to have, and maybe it would be useful for you to make a collage and create a vision board of the kind of life you want to have that has pictures and colors and feeling states in it. And as this recovery progresses, are you seeing more and more of that kind of life or are you seeing something different? Um, and is this person that you're with someone who can walk side by side with you to help co-create that life or are they going to have their attention someplace else? There's a lot of pressure in the sex addiction recovery community for partners to stay in relationships. And I believe this was um, sort of a knee-jerk reaction to um, therapists who weren't sex addiction therapists many, many years ago, and even today, that would encourage partners of sex addicts to leave immediately. But if somebody had been that unfaithful, you should just run and hide. And those therapists weren't sensitive to the complexities of you know, what it means to dismantle a home, a family, a life, bank accounts, all of it that goes with divorcing. They were just looking at the data and saying, this does not look good. Um, you know, someone writes a question, is a chronic infidelity able to be cured? You know, there are people that say no and other people that say yes. 
So it depends on the person and the circumstances. So you need to look at all of that and be rigorously honest with yourself about what do you want and is this a person who can give it to you and can you watch and wait to see if it's a person who can do it with you. Um, you know, one month is not enough time. Six months is not enough time. A year, two years, you'll start to see whether this person is really making concerted efforts and really changing their very character or if they're not. And if they're not, that gives you your answer. And even with that, it can be an incredibly difficult decision to make. But I want to encourage you to really take your time to not rush um, into any kind of, you know, over-trusting or physical contact or forgiveness. It, these things take time and they take the time that you need um, to figure it out. But try not to do it passively. Go do some workshops yourself. Um, join groups yourself. Get into your own therapy. Find active ways for answering these questions for you because all too often I watch partners sort of sit and wait and that sitting and waiting is passive and time goes on and we get older with every passing day, month, and year. So don't delay. Do as much work as you can for yourself. Um, Maggie says, thank you, Alex. I don't feel safe with my sex addict. He has broken two boundaries. He can be manipulative and say he's not perfect, which is true, but it all comes back to me and my values. It's taken me out of my integrity, and I can't have a marriage when abstinent is not consistent in his recovery. I've been there, Terry. It's a nightmare. We need healing and to be loving to ourselves. And that's right, Maggie. And if that means that it's time for you to leave this marriage, then you build a a fortress of support around yourself with friends, family members, support groups, and you know, trust that you can move on, that you'll be okay. Um, and in fact, I think all of us have the experience of staying in something too long, whether it was a relationship or a job or an exercise class or what have you. And when we finally get out of it, we think, oh my gosh, why was I waiting so long? What kept me there for so long? So don't delay. Your life is on now. Either move forward into recovery or get off the bus and go do something different. Life is much too short for that. All right. So thank you all for your participation today. This was a lively conversation. It's a tough conversation. But if I can just bring it back around, I want to remind you, first and foremost, be faithful to yourself. Be faithful to the people you love and then look at and deal with the tension of holding that paradox because it's never easy, but it's a constant way for us to grow and learn about our own selves. All right. Thank you again for all of your support of Mirror of Intimacy, which you can find on Amazon.com. And I look forward to seeing you and talking to you in August. Bye-bye.